Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, for those of you in Canada, I know you're taking a moment of silence right now uh, to commemorate all the veterans, and uh, we will uh, join you in that for a few moments. Moving on, uh, welcome to Engineering for Change, everyone, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2015 webinar series. Our webinar will focus today on sustainable design learning and practical applications of whole systems thinking. We've developed this webinar with our collaborators at the Autodesk Foundation. My name is Jana Aranda. And I will be moderating this webinar along with our colleagues from Autodesk. When I'm not doing this, I work with uh, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and Engineering for Change, where I am the Director of Programs. Now, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit about today's webinar. Reducing environmental impact through product design requires new strategies and tools. Today, Autodesk offers free online resources that can help you design for energy efficiency, use greener materials, and simulate your product's performance. We've invited Mike Alcazan, an application engineer for the Autodesk Foundation, Autodesk Education Team, my apologies, to provide an overview of the latest tools available. To shed more light on whole systems thinking as a design strategy, we'll have Jim Core, the founder and president of Core Ecologic, share his insights on how he was able to minimize the energy use of the Irby, set to be the world's greenest car. They will be joined by our moderator, Katie Evans, who is a Sustainable Design Education Program Manager at Autodesk. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally, along with myself, we have Mike Mater of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, Jackie Halliday, and Shirley Chang of IEEE. All of us work together on developing and delivering the webinars. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Now, before we get moving to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge hub and global community of nearly 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture and housing, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources such as the webinar you're on today, and a growing inventory of field-tested solutions through our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources that meet your needs and interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Please check out our website that you will see listed there, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Now, the webinar you're participating in today is part of our professional development offerings. The E4C webinar series is a free, publicly available series of online seminars showcasing the best practices and thinking of development practitioners and designers. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on our site, as well as on our YouTube channel. If you're following us today on Twitter, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. I will go ahead and get us started. I am calling in from Brooklyn, New York. There we go. I see some of you oh, already coming in, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Minnesota. And I see some of you are also answering to the Q&A. 
um, please uh, do use the chat window. We have all over the United States so far, New Jersey, Tennessee, Indiana. How, how exciting to have you all here join us. And Pakistan, not in the USA, we welcome you. So moving forward, if the chat window is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon at the top right corner of the screen, so please do that. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go in the chat window. Feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you have. During the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A window, which is located immediately below the chat, to type in your questions to the presenter. Uh, again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon on the top right-hand corner. Oh, wow, Egypt, Philadelphia, Pakistan, um, Malaysia. Oh, this is incredible. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, the Q&A window is a great way for us to keep track of your questions so nothing is lost and we make sure we address everything. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you have any trouble, try hitting stop then, and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour, PDH, for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page. I apologize, it's just the wrong link, but you can definitely get to it from our Engineering for Change webinars page. If you have any trouble, you can also email us or we'll put up the corrected link in the chat window. Now, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's uh, my co-moderator, uh, Katie Evans, who is the Sustainable Design Education Program Manager at Autodesk. Uh, after graduation from UCLA, Katie explored a number of design opportunities and eventually found her place at Autodesk in 2004, doing program and marketing management in the AEC space until she moved into her current role on the Sustainability Foundation team in 2014. Katie manages marketing, content development, strategic partnerships, event participation, and the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop, a website that provides <clears throat> content for architecture and engineering students and professionals in both building and product design. We're very excited to welcome you, Katie, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Iana. Um, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our presenters today. We're really pleased to be with, here with you and excited to present in this webinar. Again, as Iana mentioned, I'm Katie Evans, and I manage the Sustainable Design Education Program at Autodesk, including the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop, which is a website that offers free online resources that teach the principles and practice of sustainability in engineering and design. You'll learn more about this site in today's presentation. Before we get started, I'm going to make a quick introduction of first Mike Alcazarin. Mike is a graduate of University of, at Buffalo and is currently working as an application engineer for Autodesk Education Team. He's helping to integrate Autodesk's design tools into classrooms and design teams around the Northeast. While in school, Mike interned for Autodesk, helping to develop product design content for the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop. And as an engineering professional, Mike has previous experience developing mechanical designs for the DOD during his previous job at Raytheon Company. Outside of work, Mike volunteers on the Engineers for a Sustainable World Leadership Team as Development Coordinator. As you will learn, Mike is passionate about getting the latest technology into the hands of design and engineering students to help build their technical skill set and build a career solving today's most challenging problems. Our second speaker and special guest, we're very happy to be joining us for today's webinar, is Jim Kaur. Jim has emerged as a thought leader on sustainability and ecological design as founder and president of Core Ecologic. He is a detailed production design engineer with almost four decades experience. His career has focused upon new and innovative design, including the Irby Car Project, a real world application of whole systems thinking. You'll hear more about this later on in today's presentation. Jim now combines vision with empathy and believes that the ultimate goal of design is to serve the public good. Concerned about the current state of our environment, he's committed to designing only worthwhile products that carefully work in harmony with the natural landscape. In 2013, Jim was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Green Industry Hall of Fame. And with that, I think we're ready to get started. I'd now like to hand it over to Mike Alcazarin. Mike? As Katie said, my name is Mike Alcazarin. 
Um, I'll be hosting the first part of today's webinar. So I'd like to start things off with what inspires me and you know what I am really passionate about and what inspires uh, me deep down inside. So personally, I have a deep love of the outdoors. To me, there's nothing better to uh, after a long hike, you smell that fresh pine scent, and you know you're exhausted, but it's just beautiful outside. And I really want my grandchildren and children to experience the same things that I did with nature. I mean, really embrace that. But on the other side of the coin, I also have a deep love for technology. Uh, this love has always inspired me and driven me. Um, things that fly, like the space shuttle here, it really speaks to my engineering passion. I find that working at Autodesk is a perfect mix of both of those things. The Autodesk vision is to help people imagine, design, and create a better world. <clears throat> and how do we do this? So there's over 100 million design professionals, artists, engineers, students, and hobbyists, and they're all using our software to unlock their creativity to solve important design, business, and environmental challenges. And you can build dedicated content towards solving these challenges, such as the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop. The Autodesk Sustainability Workshop offers free online resources that teach the principles and practice of sustainability in engineering and design. This site was created to help educators teach and students learn about sustainability in engineering and architecture professions. You will find two main tracks, building design and product design. Within our product design track, there's free videos, software tutorials, and case studies to help you design for energy efficiency or use greener materials, or even simulate your project or product performance. The product design track that I'll focus on today features topics such as whole systems and life cycle thinking, as well as lightweighting, complete with software tutorials and examples. One of our product design tracks is whole systems design. Part of our content is free videos that explain the concepts of sustainable design principles, such as whole systems design. To help explain this content, we include Autodesk subject matter experts as well as a character, Mr. Imagination, who helps explain the concepts of sustainable design to all the masses. Here is a quick reference guide. It's available on the Sustainability Workshop at sustainabilityworkshop.autodesk.com, and it introduces two of the most important concepts to sustainable design, and this is whole systems and life cycle thinking. Whole systems thinking, it's a way of thinking about the related social, environmental, and technical systems that a product is part of. For example, how is the product used? Who manufactures it? And what other products are used with it? Life cycle thinking, it's a way of thinking about all of the stages involved within a product's life, from raw materials extraction to manufacture to the transport, use, and disposal. Life cycle assessment, it's a way of quantifying your environmental impacts that occur at each and at every stage. So for example, what if we want to build a more sustainable dryer? We have a variety of tools that we've learned throughout our education and experiences to get there, from choosing alternative energy sources to using unique resources such as less materials or recycled materials, and also designing for lifetime or designing for durability or recyclability. With traditional approaches, we might look at small efficiency gains, such as using a less toxic material or maybe even using those recycled materials. However, as we dive deeper, you might realize that the minimal efficiencies that you gain it will have enormous engineering effort, as these parts might have already been optimized, such as an electric motor. So let's introduce a whole systems design approach. Let's define our problem and then look at the whole system. This is step one of a whole systems design approach. So we have our dryer again. We've been tasked with building a more sustainable dryer. That's great, but what about diving deeper into this? What are we actually trying to do here? Whole systems thinking, it's all about taking a step back and look at the actual problem in its entirety. We see in this diagram that our dryer, it's just a piece of a much larger closed cleaning process. Once we have this whole system down, now we can start to think about all of our engineering toolkit analysis, looking at cost, looking at time, or energy usage of our product. From here, we can start to ask questions like what parts and subsystems make up the product? How do these parts connect? And when and why does a user even use this? Our second step will begin to prioritize our objectives by assessing life cycle impacts. Using life cycle analysis or similar quantitative tools to measure the impacts of all of the stages identified in step one, anything from CO2 output to toxic materials 
that may be included within our materials or manufacturing process. The top two pictures are screenshots showing what it looks like to enter data into LCA programs such as Semipro on the left and Sustainable Minds on the right. The bottom two pictures are screenshots showing what it looks like to get, these result, get results from these LCA programs. It's important to note that this LCA data, it's not very precise. Uh, we can usually assume about a 10% margin of error, so your differences should be roughly 20% or greater when you consider them important. Using this analysis, we can start to have a better and deeper understanding of where we can make the biggest jumps or improvements upon our design. So once the LCA is started and completed, we can begin to ask more pointed questions, like where are our biggest impacts? What impacts can we control? This will shape our list of priorities. In our quest for a more sustainable dryer, reducing energy usage, not impacting user convenience, and costs begin to arise as our potential top priorities in the design process. And even better, once we have our list of priorities, we can add specific and quantifiable metrics to these priorities, like not adding any cost or time to the closed cleaning process. In step three, we can begin to brainstorm solutions by looking at how they fit and how they work and operate within this whole system that we've drawn up. Using our engineering design toolkit, we can take a deeper dive into this whole system to take a critical look at our process. Whole systems thinking, it means looking at all the different parts of the system and how they relate to each other. <clears throat> What's inside of the black boxes? For example, within our washing process, you might have a fill, a wash, a dry, or a spin, a fill, and so on and so forth within the black box of the washer. What happens if we redraw, redraw this diagram? This is the exact same diagram as before, but I just redrew it to look linear, and I colored the transition points in blue. We can use various brainstorm methods to think of unique ways to get from one transition point to the next, like maybe having a faster spin cycle, or maybe having some presses that ring together to close to dry. We can keep applying, a, we can keep applying brainstorming techniques to different transition points, but like going from wet clean clothes to dry clean clothes. Here we see we get some wild ideas from grilling our clothes to air drying them to the standard heat and tumble. No idea is off the table. How far up the system can we go? And how many steps can we skip? Here, the highest up would be skipping all of our steps. What if our clothes had never even got dirty to begin with? Could we do that? How would we go about doing that? This approach of whole systems design thinking was spearheaded by an organization called the Rocky Mountain Institute. They have an amazing wealth of resources, and one such example is their Factor 10 design principles. And this helps drive 10x improvements throughout the engineering process. Definitely check them out on the web for more information. Our fourth step is to use our predefined metrics to evaluate and choose solutions. We can see if we estimate life cycle impacts of all major design options, and see how much they improve performance. For example, maybe our solution for a more sustainable dryer isn't a dryer at all. Maybe it's actually a more energy intensive washing machine that just has a higher spin cycle. It might use more energy to spin, but in the whole scheme of things, it's going to use less energy to heat and to tumble. <clears throat> Here are some screenshots that quantify some scenario comparisons in two different LCA programs, the Simapro and Sustainable Minds. And once again, remember our 10% margin of error. So any differences that we look for in the design <clears throat> should be about 20% or greater before we consider them important. So here's our hypothetical list of design options for our more sustainable dryer. Everything from grilling our clothes to a faster spin cycle. So we might see that <clears throat> options B, C, and E, they're close enough to our original existing design using our 20% margin metric. This may not be enough to warn us to pursue these ideas further, so let's get rid of them and let's drop them. If we eliminate all but the best design options, or at least the options that don't improve performance based off of our metrics, and remember we can balance all of our other metrics, such as cost and time usage. Finally, we can repeat these steps over and over again to optimize all aspects of our designs, large or small. So in summary, 
we can use whole systems to expand or deepen your definition of the problem. From there, we can apply life cycle thinking to measure the problem and set priorities to fix it. We'll jump back to whole systems thinking to ideate solutions, and then we'll rank which solutions are best using life cycle of thinking. Uh, once again, this is our whole system thinking reference guide, our quick reference guide. For more research, resources, be sure to check out the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop at sustainabilityworkshop.autodesk.com. So now I'll pass things off to Jim Core, who will introduce the ERPI. It's a great real-world and practical example of whole systems design in action. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Mike, and thank you, Autodesk. Uh, uh, what an honor it is um, to be here. And welcome to everybody online. Um, today I'm going to talk about innovation and why you should use uh, whole systems design. I'm speaking to you from Canada, the middle of Canada, and I'm actually at my cottage, so it's just a miracle of technology that I can reach you. Um, and I'm looking out over one of the 100,000 natural lakes in our province. And just the other day, we had the Northern Lights put on quite a show. So like Mike, I really, really can't imagine a world uh, without a natural environment. And soon, uh, it's snowing actually right now, and soon it's going to be 40 below, um, and the streets will look like this in spite of global warming. So like Mike, I also really like uh, technology. I, I want, always wanted to design cars. I'm old enough to know what drafting boards look like, and my background is... Uh, always working in small groups of uh, very innovative people, pretty well the same people my whole life, and um, worked on really big equipment uh, like tractors and, and buses, and over time, and some automotive controls, and over time I, I felt a responsibility regarding the impact of my designs. So I moved into research projects, and then um, all I do now is uh, sustainable design. Okay, so let's get, this is the agenda I'm going to follow, and uh, maybe let's get started. There's uh, two types of design. I'm guessing that uh, most of you are doing incremental design, just slight improvements uh, to existing products, and whole systems design is rarely done, uh, but it uh, can find elegant solutions, and it's a safer way to design for the future. So incremental design, you just uh, look at, you focus on one part of the object, and in the past, we used quite a linear way of thinking right to, to the landfill. <laughs> and then uh, recently, we started recycling, introducing a small loop into the, the process. But I would argue that this is still uh, downcycling of most materials. Now, the king of incremental design was the old uh, Volkswagen Beetle, the classic one, because they prided themselves into not changing the exterior, but doing many refinements on the interior. And um, over 24 million beetles sold worldwide, and they all look the same. <laughs> um, and uh, it was actually a, a car that did not focus on itself, but on the journey it supported. And a lot of people embraced this car, even though the car magazines didn't really go for it. And it was also an extremely honest and frugal car. So there's a lot to be learned from the beetle. Now, in whole systems design, yeah, you, there, you really take a whole rethink of the object. Um, everything is up for grabs. And if you do sustainable design, there's a circularity to the whole process uh, that, that does uh, mimic ecological processes. Uh, in the commercial world, uh, the iPod can be seen as you know, a leap forward in innovation where it really left the Walkman and the Discman behind and, and carved out a new category of product. And Braun and Apple are just brilliant at doing this, uh, and their designers are exceptional. And each one of their products is indeed a leap of design, impossible with incremental design. Another leader is Ray Anderson, who took his uh, carpet company to new levels of cleanliness and is really a, a model of what can be done regarding sustainability. And uh, whole system thinking really has its roots with this man, Ian McCarg. And um, if you haven't read Design with Nature, uh, it's really uh, worth, worth a read. Uh, he holds the key how to, to how to design for the future. So whole systems um, is different uh, than incremental in that it does take way longer uh, to, to accomplish it. 
you do need very sophisticated tools. Um, it's more an interdisciplinary approach, and the acceptance uh, usually takes quite a bit longer uh, for, from the public point of view. The good news is we have the internet, like I'm talking to you now <laughs> with this webinar. You know, we we can connect with people all over the world. We can access information, so it really opens the door for whole systems design. And certainly, there are no um, lack of uh, complex global problems that need addressing, like the inequality in the world or uh, the specter of global warming. And sustainable development, if we achieve it, is going to require a paradigm shift, um, I think, very similar to what happened in 1543 when Copernicus put the sun at the center of the solar system and the whole world had to change their mind uh, from then on. And so when's the last time you changed your mind? You know, it's a, and I don't mean just dinner or uh, what to have for dinner or a movie. I mean fundamentally change your mind. It's a very scary thought. <laughs> so, so in a nutshell, um, I think of incremental and the whole systems design like this. Incremental design is like driving with your low beams on and without any seat belts. And whole systems design is like driving with your high beams on and with your seat belts securely fastened. So you can see the road ahead and you can avoid hazards. Now I'd like to use the Olympic high jump as a, as a good example of uh, successful innovation. Uh, everyone used to jump over the bar like this for about 100 years because you had to land on your feet. And as the landing became a little softer with sand, people started to use this technique like in the 50s. And then in 1960s, they, they adopted this large foam pad. And then by 68, the Fosbury flop uh, was invented by Dick Fosbury, and um, he leapt over the board backwards. And uh, this this way of jumping is actually more energy efficient. And when I did research on this, um, you know, the high jump has had incremental improvements all along, but speckled with uh, leaps uh, in advancement on different techniques. And Fosbury, uh, no surprise, uh, was a civil engineer at the time, a student. And um, so he was trying to optimize the jump. And he looked at it from a, a purely engineering point of view. And, um, and yet he was rather ridiculed. You know, the Fosbury flop was named in 1964 um, and because flop means failure. And, uh, and then also he, uh, some, a reporter said something like, uh, it's like a guy falling off the back of a truck. So everyone was very uneasy when he did this. Uh, but then he won gold, and everyone changed their mind. And as I researched this young man, it was ph phenomenal how um, how much tenacity he had to stick to it. When his coaches told him not to do it, um, and, he, and they nicknamed him Fearless. Um, so what can be learned from the Fosbury flop now that it's a success, now that every Olympian uses it? I would say anticipate a lengthy gestation period. Um, Expect huge resistance. Prepare to be ridiculed even. Muster the inner courage to pioneer on. Make sure the outcome is incontestable. Like once he won gold, no one can deny it was better. Trust the, that science will prevail. And trust the results will prove game-changing. And trust that you are not the only one doing it. Because, um, actually, there was a Canadian woman also doing it at the same time. It's just that Fosbury won the gold first. Uh, but um, it's not unusual to have innovation spawn up in different places at the same time. Because we are not separate from the problems we create. And problems whisper solutions. And you may not be the only one listening. Okay, so let me talk about the automobile. Um, you know, the automobile of the future, to be specific. And, uh, you know, we love to listen uh, and think about what we're going to live in tomorrow, uh, even though we're uh, often wrong about the future. And cars are quite different than the high jump in that they are an extremely emotional object, full of fantasy and style. Cars need to have big grills and lots of exhaust pipes. The more, the better. So this would be a really good car, and this would be even a better car. 
So what is all this infatuation with the horse bar under the hood? You are what you drive, they tell us. But I think to really understand this, we have to look inside the brain. And the human brain developed with a primitive brain at first. And this brain reacts without thinking and wants to dominate. That's the survival strategy that has got us to here. And the civilized brain is contemplative, rational, thinks long term, and has empathy. So humans are now dominating the world, but can we really survive without nature? Can we really survive without bees? Well, I don't think so. Um, but can rational thinking win out inside our heads? We are not separate from the world we create, so we must be careful how we think. So now let me tell you a bit about the Irby as an example um, of whole systems design. Uh, to be clear, we just built one car, a first prototype, and it's a real car. It really drives on the road. Um, and we're working on a second one, and um, which we hope to take uh, as our incontestable result from New York to San Francisco in 10 gallons of biofuel. And it's awaiting funding to, for us to do that. Ask what the product should be if it did not exist but had to be thought out from the beginning. That's how you should start. And our premise was that technology that achieves the best fit within the natural environment will serve us best. And we didn't have any preconceived ideas of a car, but we certainly had the Model T or the Volkswagen Beetle in mind, but with uh, safety and emissions improved. And we wanted something that was fabulous but frugal. So our goal was to create the greenest car on Earth. We wanted to run in, uh, the car solely on renewable energy. So we imagined a garage and a vehicle as a system that moved the vehicle around on the, on the face of the Earth. We did a lot of trip scenarios and calculations. We envisioned a powertrain that was both efficient in the city and on the highway. We built some scale models so we could communicate what we were thinking. Then we built a full-scale mock-up um, that uh, was in our shop that really communicated and what we were thinking and how everything would fit. Then we entered XPRIZE, which really gave the project a boost. We did a lot of uh, Autodesk CAD files and uh, drew the, most of the car in the computer, built a frame, tested that frame uh, extensively, then carved the body out of clay, scanned the body in the computer, did simulations on aerodynamics to make sure that we achieved the right result, and then asked Stratasys if they could 3D print such large pieces, and they could. So then we cut up the body in the computer into 20 pieces, 3D printed a small scale model to make sure that all the pieces fit. And when they fit, we did it all in full scale. And this caused quite a bit of media attention that it was the first 3D printed car body. And then we finished the car and unveiled it in Winnipeg at the TEDx uh, talk and then just took it for a quiet ride around a local park and called the project finished. Um, and as, a, as far as a first prototype, it was a technical success, and um, um, we wanted to then continue on with a second one. There was a lot of interest in the car, so the car went to Europe. Here it is in London. It also went to Paris and Frankfurt. And the media attention still continues on the car, and even the automotive magazines are are uh, kind to us, which uh, shows us that something, some changes in the air. So, and of course, the big deal is that uh, you know you can reduce the carbon footprint dramatically if you focus on energy efficiency. We wrote a technical paper and presented it in Hungary uh, in 2010 to an automotive audience. So, what did we learn from all of this experience? Well. Um, I learned that you have to use about 100 times less energy if you want to go on to renewables than we're used to with fossil fuels. And if you really um, think about pushing this vehicle around, you have to focus on four things. You have to reduce the weight of the car. You have to reduce the air resistance of the car. You have to reduce the rolling resistance. And you have to reduce the frontal area. 
and all design is a compromise, I can accept that, but it is where we compromise that will determine our eventual long-term success. So let me address the ultimate green dream machine. Is it really, um, you know, can a luxury road rocket ever be truly green? You know, can all the bars uh, be fully on to the right? I don't think so. Big and heavy cars demand lots of power, which causes lots of pollution, and this physical reality cannot be denied. So most electric cars of today uh, stress performance, race car performance, and luxury because they're just um, um, too nervous to give that up uh, in that no one would buy their cars. But I envision a new category of cars that are the environmental cars of tomorrow where energy efficiency and sustainability are stressed and the uh, performance is compromised, but not to the point where it won't work in traffic and not to the point where you aren't comfortable or safe. So we believe we are defining what a car should look like if it is required to run solely on renewable energy. Now, Winston Churchill famously said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. We are all a product of our environment. And by changing what he knows about the world, man changes the world he knows. And by changing the world in which he lives, man changes himself. And um, so contrary to what they tell us, you are not what you drive but you become what you drive. And so I think a very important point is we need to carefully choose only those technologies that will shape us into what we want to become. So when is the last time you changed your mind really in a fundamental way? Rethink your ideas of progress. Don't confuse sport or racing cars with transportation. And think of true progress as tiny exhaust pipes and simple cars with long lives. And use incremental design, use it to fix a problem for sure, but use whole systems design to find impossibly elegant, completely rational, and sustainable solutions. And make sustainable, a sustainable world your dream, and then pass that dream on to your children. Well, thanks for listening. Um, I'd like to thank all our supporters worldwide. And if you need any further information, uh, you can be sure to email me and I'll uh, answer you for sure. Um, thank you very much. Really appreciate this opportunity. Um, now I would say uh, it's back to Mike. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I always love to hear the story of the uh, you know, It's a great and a practical whole systems design thinking approach uh, to a problem. And it's a problem that we all see pretty much every day with transportation. Uh, so we saw that you know, yourself and your awesome team, you know, you got a pretty red design using those techniques. But what if we already have thought out the whole system design approach, uh, and you want to grab your engineering toolbox and take things a little bit further and dive a little bit deeper? Uh, and what if we take this and optimize just a small part of our design with incremental design? So you can use sustainable design techniques, such as lightweighting, to make these design changes after applying whole systems thinking. The Sustainability Workshop's product design track, it has plenty of great additional resources on specific sustainable design concepts, such as lightweighting. Uh, this content introduces concepts, videos, and specific examples that are detailed in step-by-step -step software tutorials. Uh, one of the examples that we have content developed on is lightweighting. One of our Mr. Imagination videos details an introduction to lightweighting and material reduction. I'll do a quick summary of some of these important concepts to round out today's webinar. So let's say we've taken a whole systems design approach and we come up with something awesome. It's a revolutionary transportation device. We know that what we have is good, but we're leaving a lot on the table. So we've decided to choose lightweighting as an approach to optimize our design. There are a bunch of great strategies for creating lighter geometry, like creating hollow, like hollowing parts and decreasing wall thickness, using reinforcements like posts and ribs, or using trusses. The content on the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop will help us maintain integrity in these lighter weight designs by avoiding stress concentrations, following lines of force, or using tensegrity. There are some good basic rules of thumbs before we pursue lightweighting as a strategy. Before we can really dive into how to lightweight, let's look at when it's the right strategy. It's the right strategy if materials or waste are a big part of your product's ecological or social impact. If 
For designing something that moves or is powered by a motor or other energy source, if our function, if it's well-defined and our form is at least roughly known, and you can fully understand the forces at work, if you don't, lightweighting could compromise our product's robustness. There are other times when lightweighting can be a liability, such as if it interferes with any of our other strategies that we consider important, such as design for durability, repair, or long life, or if the design or manufacturing costs are too high compared with other sustainable strategies, such as using lightweighted, such as using recycled materials. Here's an example of lightweighting in action. Utility Scale Solar is a company that builds large-scale solar farms. The solar panel in the background image is one of their original designs for a solar panel tracker that would be put into a large um, multi-hundred multi panel farm. To give you an idea of the size of this panel, the connection from the panel to the rod is about one meter in diameter, near the orange and blue in this picture. Hundreds of these connectors will be made across the farm. Their initial design is shown on the left. And using lightweighting techniques of ribbing, following lines of force, and adjusting material thickness, they were able to reduce the weight of the final tracking assembly by about 61 kilograms. So they went from 296 kilograms to 235 kilograms. Uh, this example hits on some of our major lightweighting design requirements, such as intensive material use. Vehicle, it moves the solar panel, and the form and function is pretty static. So due to the sheer quantity of panels that this assembly is installed on, any weight reductions that we made here, they're going to have a significant impact on the final environmental impact um, with materials usage. On the right-hand side is a CAD model that had FEA analysis performed on it to show the effects of lightweighting. So using Autodesk software such as Fusion 360, we're able to make sure that we hold to our minimum requirements that our engineering design team sets in advance. Let's do a quick example of lightweighting using Autodesk's software portfolio to optimize a part for lightweighting. This example that I'll walk through, which is the Utility Scale Solar, or USS, this example is also available on the Sustainability Workshop, complete with PDFs and videos that you can follow along with our software. So what is Fusion 360? Uh, Fusion 360 is a cloud-enabled industrial and mechanical engineering CAD and CAM tool. Uh, we found that current CAD platforms, they're fragmented, they're expensive, they might be disconnected, and they're also very limiting. So with Fusion, we're bringing together some of the technologies that had previously been separate. We started by having a mechanical and design, mechanical design and industrial design tools together brought in one cloud-based application. We built data management into that environment, and we brought together design tools along with visualization, simulation, and fabrication tools like CAM, or computer-assisted manufacturing, and 3D printing. We built an ecosystem so that people could share and collaborate their work with increasingly distributed design teams and supply chains. We think that this is the right vision for solving the complexities of today's design teams. Fusion 360 is an integrated product development platform. It's one software to take you from concept to creation and fabrication. So you can use the industrial design techniques, such as surface modeling, and mechanical parametric design to create designs and fabricate them directly within Fusion 360. Additionally, because Fusion is cloud-enabled, you can manage your data when you want to and with whomever you want to. And having this cloud-enabled platform allows us to collaborate across different teams that might not, might not normally speak to each other, from design to the customer to engineering and vendors, all the way to manufacturing. And within Fusion 360, you'll be able to collaborate on your models, on your drawings, simulations, videos, renderings, and specifications of your product. We wanted to make Fusion 360 accessible to everyone. It works natively on Mac and on PC. And because Fusion 360 is cloud-enabled, you can access all of your files on any internet-connected device, including mobile devices. Uh, it's important to note that Fusion 360 is free for startups and for, hobby for hobbyists. Um, so any, anyone that earns less than $100,000 in revenue can, and also nonprofits can obtain Fusion 360 on a one-year uh, renewable license, so you can keep renewing that as long as you want to. Uh, students and educational institutions um, also receive Fusion 360 as a free three-year license, along with over 170 other Autodesk software products. If you check out autodesk360.autodesk.com to download Fusion 360. So here's an example of this solar panel tracker that we'll dive into Fusion 360. 
So here I've loaded up the design of the end cap within Fusion 360. Here on the left, we have our data panel. And our data panel is our access to all of our cloud information. So you can see all of the projects that we're shared with and shared on, such as this sustainable design pro project. If we want to make any design changes throughout, we can go to our timeline and roll back our design to edit a previously made function, such as an extrude or a revolve. You can also add parameters to your model in case you want to make bulk changes or you've already captured your design intent with names. So for this lightweighting example, the two parameters that we'll play with is thickness and height. Our thickness is our material thickness across our half dome, and the height is the half height of this panel. If I right-click the top, we can check out the properties and see that this is about 269 kilograms. So there's still some room left to lightweight this product. All within the same software program, we can switch over to the simulation environment by clicking Model and changing our workspace to simulation. I have previously set up an analysis showing the stress, displacement, and safety factor, as well as some of our additional design requirements. If I want to set up a simulation, you have two options. You can choose between a static stress analysis or modal frequency analysis. To set up today's study, I'll start from my settings. Give this setting a name. I can edit my mesh settings. For this example, I'll use 10 to 20%. I can turn on adaptive mesh refinement. So if I turn this on, the mesh will recalculate during areas of high, um, high areas where there might be a potential for high concentrations of stress. I'll add my structural constraints. I know that this piece will be fixed at the top around this ring in all three directions. Select OK. And I'll add my structural loads. So the load for this is 2.6 megapascals. And that's calculated using wind force. And if we can withstand wind force, we can withstand that, that's typically the highest force in this scenario. We can create manual contacts. In this case, I'll just use the automatic bonded contacts as if every single piece is glued together. I can change the materials and add custom materials. And I can press solve to solve and generate our design and see if it passes our design requirements. For this example, we want about a 1.5 uh, safety factor. And we can see down below here in the right, if we toggle down, we can see that our stress, our safety factor is about 2.19, so this design passes our initial test. If we want to look at displacement, Fusion 360 will show you an overdramatic view of where the most displacement is occurring. And as expected, it's where the supports do not exist. If we want to make quick design changes, you can switch between the simulation and the modeling environment very quickly. So I'm going to switch back to the modeling workspace and edit some parameters. So let's say that I know I want to see if the thickness can be 13. And maybe I can reduce the height from 225 to 200. And if I right-click the end cap for properties, I can see that this mass has been reduced to 2.5, 250 kilograms. Within Fusion, my simulation settings have been saved. I'll only need to click Resolve, and it will resolve the model with the exact same design restraints, constraints and parameters in the previous simulation. So here we can quickly see that we're still within our 1.5 minimum safety factor for this design. 
And from here, we can keep applying additional light weighting techniques, such as adding more ribs or removing some additional material and getting engineering results to see if this withstands our design parameters. So what's next? Go to sustainabilityworkshop.autodesk.com and check out all of the resources that we have on sustainable design for mechanical engineers. You can also visit impactdesignhub.org to view this webinar on demand and to access more impact design content and resources. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Jim. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, we're going to uh, go into some Q&A right now. We have about uh, seven or eight minutes left. I encourage you to enter any questions you have into the Q&A panel as we go. Uh, we've only received a couple so far, but we'll get started. Uh, and this first question actually could be for either you, Jim, or Mike, um, but why don't we go ahead and I'm going to start with you, Jim, with answering this question. Um, is there a simple approach to do life cycle assessment? Yes, there's definitely an approach. Um, um, the life cycle assessment has, is sort of well developed, and um, uh, the book Cradle to Cradle talks about that. It used to be uh, Cradle to Grave, and then now now it's Cradle to Great Cradle. In other words, um, we don't have to go to the grave. Ideally. Uh, we wouldn't landfill anything. Uh, that's sort of the holy grail of um, uh, life cycle assessment. Also, um, uh, within life cycle assessment is the life of the product. Um, you know, how long should it survive? And my experience with tractors and buses, you know, they are routinely designed for a life of close to 30 years. Many of the tractors uh, and buses, uh, I still see them 35, 40 years later uh, that I worked on. And, um, and that's a much more technically difficult task than, than uh, making other products last a long time. So that's another change that I think needs to happen, um, reviewing planned obsolescence and uh, designing for a long, long life. Does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Mike, do you have anything to share or add to that from your perspective? I, I would definitely agree with Jim on that um, Cradle to Cradle is a great resource to, to take a first dive into. And also um, trying to find some LCA softwares are, are also good. I know there's some free open source ones as well as some, some ones that you can pay for as well. That's a good place to start. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here for you, Jim. Um, looking at the Irby, it appears very clearly to be a very small car and sits very low to the ground. So if you're driving this car in traffic, what is the safety? Is it, what are, what are the, the safety factors? Is this a safe car to drive? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and we get that question all the time. Um, because um, the smart car was uh, is more is the most modern car that is trying to pioneer you know more rigid structures in a small vehicle, but uh, the, the there is a real science to car safety and actually the ones that are are really at the forefront of that are race cars, and especially Formula One. So uh, uh, Formula One had a goal a recent goal of zero death, and then they started to put black boxes in the Formula One race cars and and analyze the different accidents. And um, so they really, I think race cars um, are the safest vehicles um, on earth right now. So believe it or not, with Irby, we took sort of the stance that we would try to pass the Le Mans safety inspection. <laughs> you know, because Le Mans is a, <laughs> Le Mans is a, uh, used to be much more so, but cars that you could drive on the road and because um, you need headlights and turn signals and all that stuff. And, um, but if you can pass the safety inspection, then um, I think most people would agree that that's a pretty safe car. Um, 
we're no lower than the, the lowest production car that ever was on the road, and that happens to be the Ford GT40. Ford, Ford actually sold it for a while, so it's 40, Ford GT40 is 40 inches tall. Uh, most um, exotic cars nowadays are 42 inches tall, um, so we made Irby 40 inches tall, and that's uh, the same as the Ford GT40. And that's to reduce the frontal area. Because uh, the more you, you know, it's just too much air to push around. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I do believe, I, I don't expect the audience to believe, but I, I do believe that a small car designed properly with race car standards can be extremely survivable in a crash, in a typical traffic accident crash, either on the highway or on the city. Terrific. Thank you. That's You're terrific, welcome. Jim. Appreciate that. Um, another question here, I'll go ahead and start um, with you, Mike. Uh, in terms of collaboration, is there a limit to that with the free software that is offered? In terms of collaboration, you can, I guess with Fusion 360, you can invite, um, I think it's over a thousand people into the same project. Um, so you can definitely scale up very quickly with, with sharing that data. And in terms of free software, um, we have a great education program where all of our software is available for free to um, education, um, to teachers, students, and educational institutions on three-year licenses. Um, so if you need to scale up for license for that, there's no limit for that as long as you have a member, yeah, as long as you are a member of a accredited educational institution. Um, and with Fusion 360 specifically, it's um, free for nonprofits and for startups and anyone that makes less than $100,000 on a one-year commercial license. Great. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think as we're approaching the top of the hour now, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I do want to thank everyone for the questions that have come in, and I do apologize for any we've been unable to get to right now. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Iana, and we're going to wrap things up. And I just want to, on behalf of Autodesk and um, Jim Core from Core Ecologic, thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today. Iana? Thank you so much, everybody else, for joining us from all over the world. We really appreciate you participating. For those of you who are interested in getting your professional development hours, please follow the instructions on our professional development page. Uh, the PDH code is listed on the current slide, and I'll put up the URL where you can find the rest of the instructions in a second. Uh, additionally, if you have additional questions or if you uh, are looking to make a suggestion about webinars that we can have in the future, please email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org and um, join us so that we can also send you information on upcoming webinars. And thank you so much for uh, my colleague Jackie for putting up that URL, and I thank you all again, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be. Take care.